watching this on a phone, tablet or a laptop, you're not going to be surprised by the fact that Europe's digital economy is growing seven times faster than any other sector. But its share of the 2,000 billion euro global market is still only a quarter. So welcome to Real Economy's breakdown of our digital road ahead. On the show, we look at a French car share startup that's going global. We'll speak to its founder and CEO and to one of the world's largest tech investors, Axel Partners. We'll also look at the digital challenges facing traditional industries like tourism and the challenge for us, the people for whom digital must be sustainable. Not all of us can afford a car, let alone a Ferrari. So 2 million travellers, including half a million new subscribers, use Blah Blah Car every month to travel from city to city. That's a whopping 12 million subscribers in just three years, helping this French company raise 80 million euros. The plan? To go global. Pretty rare for a European startup. So Gianni Maggi took a ride to find out what its appeal is. A phenomenon of the internet age. You're planning a long car journey, either last minute or weeks in advance. You go online and a few clicks later, it's organized, as simple as that. It's not just car sharing. You can rent a holiday apartment or even charter a sailboat through this people-to-people -people model. Anyone can answer an ad on the website, and that's how we found Clément, who uses Blah Blah Car for his weekly commute. Every Friday night after my work week, I went back to Bordeaux at the weekend and returned on Sunday or Monday. I had no problem filling my car and covering my expenses. In fact, apart from fatigue, the trip cost me nothing. This kind of service is developing rapidly worldwide. Blah Blah Car, the biggest car sharing site in Europe, operates in 13 countries and has 180 staff. What we end up building in Europe is we end up building like a very low cost and social transport network. What we're now building actually in new countries uh, that we launched actually in 2014 and that we launch in the future is we're actually providing a transport network that was not there and we end up connecting cities that were not connected before. Joining me is the founder and CEO of Blah Blah Car, Frederick Marzella, and Philippe Beautry from one of the world's most famous venture capital firms out of the Silicon Valley, Axel Partners. They're also investors in Blah Blah Car. Gentlemen, thanks very much for giving us your time. Fred, let's start with you. How hard was it to make Blah Blah a reality? We have like uh, the infrastructure, uh, we had the people, and we could make the idea a reality. In Europe, there is also a sentiment sometimes which could go against growing a company like this, which is like pessimism, it will never work. Uh, but overall, uh, everything in Europe uh, could help us. When you look at other companies you invested in Europe, do you think they and governments actually create the right setup? We've started 30 years ago in Silicon Valley when you have been in Europe for 15 years and have clearly seen the development of this ecosystem and think act that it is actually a very uh, interesting geography to invest. When you look at a European consumer, have they changed a lot in the last couple of years? You can look at uh, uh, products like uh, Dropbox, which are like uh, going from owning your disk space to using it. You can look at companies like Spotify or Deezer. We are moving from owning to using, and this is a tendency which is actually global, and it's been helped to be global because uh, we are now able to build global companies, even starting from uh, anywhere in the world. What I've seen is a real willingness from the different governments to actually push this digital agenda and wanting to review some of the laws that are regulating these markets. The next step, if we want to accelerate things further, would be to unify this legislation at a European level. I mean, just to take one example, so a company called Hustle.com, which launched in London, which is a marketplace for cleaners. So they launched in the UK, which you know, a specific set of law. Then you know, they launched in Dublin, which is another set of law. Then they launched in Paris, and it is a completely different set of law. There is a lot of comparison between Europe and the US. I mean, the big difference is the US is a massive market. In Europe, it is a massive market, but it's fragmented. So let's pause for a second and look at the fact that in an environment of high unemployment in Europe, 900,000 jobs are still vacant because of a lack of IT skills. 39% of Europe's workforce has insufficient digital skills, while 14% have none at all. So here's a crash course on how a digital agenda can potentially create jobs. Three quarters of Europe is now connected via broadband and Bob and his father have turned that connectivity into a business opportunity. Bob became a digital entrepreneur three years ago with the promise of a digital single market in the future. 
He trained in IT skills and used the private sector and EU startup and education programs to get the skills he needed. Bob then connected online, building trade specialists in Europe to the people who needed them by innovating a new mobile app. R&D and innovation helped Bob and his friends create 1.8 million mobile app jobs, even in a tough economy. Bob's father, an electrician, hadn't had much business in that time. Bob retrained him to understand how computers, the cloud and digital worked. Thanks to Bob's app and his new skills in using a computer, Bob's father was suddenly the busiest electrician in Europe. Bob's family and Europeans like them are basing the economy on digital bytes. Why? Because going digital could create millions of jobs. Fred, your team is mostly under 29. How hard is it for you to find the right skill set? But it's, it's hard to find mostly the tech resources. And actually what they say in Silicon Valley today is that they need a second Silicon Valley. Uh, we don't even have one uh, yet in Europe. The challenge has been to make sure that our brand image as an employer was uh, getting known a bit better so that we could attract talent for an ecosystem to work. Uh, the cities have to think the same. I mean, they have to create their own image as a good city for welcoming all technology companies. In, in this building, you have companies like, you know, Criteo, which went public, you know, you have Blah Blah Car here. I mean, these two companies combined have created more than a, a thousand jobs in just one building in Paris. And all this, you know, this creating job all across uh, the, the region. And these jobs are actually at different levels. I mean, you have job in, in IT, uh, but if you look at some of the marketplaces that you, we mentioned, like, you know, hustle.com, uh, you know, they have 2000 cleaners on their marketplace, uh, uh, you know, already. We have to prepare the next generation for jobs we don't know yet, uh, in a context we don't know yet, for products we don't know yet, but we have to get the right mindset and make sure that education is keeping up with the fast pace of all this uh, uh, evolution. Is a digital single market key then? Uh, it would be great if that, you know, there could be a, a legal framework at the European level so that, you know, companies that are, you know, in this framework then could scale much faster. It's important to raise the awareness of, uh, of the digital economy of the young uh, people and so that they can find career paths, um, you know, in this new economy. Well, talking about jobs potentially lost or created, 72% of us use the internet, with almost half of us shopping online, but only 14% of SMEs use the net to sell their product. This despite the fact that, say, the European regional funds have invested around 3 billion euros in trying to address that gap. So, Gianni Maggi took off on a wine-tasting holiday, lucky man, to see how the tourism industry, a big employer in Europe, is coping with a digitally savvy consumer. It's the epitome of a traditional way of life and seems a million miles away from the digital world. But the internet and social media are revolutionizing the way wine producers do business. Every year, millions of tourists visit the Loire Valley, one of France's top wine regions. Increasingly, they're using smartphones to organize wine tastings, visits to vineyards, and accommodation in country houses. And local businesses are keen to capitalize. When you create a poster, you talk to a stream of people walking past that poster. And so you talk the same way to everyone. The internet allows you to talk to everyone in a one-to-one -one way. Social networks allow us to implement very specific things, such as specific campaigns for individual wine appellations. Digital means new commercial opportunities for producers and also spreads awareness of their activities. Behind us, there are 17 centuries of tradition. It really is a legacy of which we're the lucky recipients, and this legacy must be bequeathed. Digital is what allows us to pass on these values, this knowledge, this experience. It's a combination of age-old production methods, digital technology, and a radical shift in consumer habits. Today, the vast majority of internet users buy their travel arrangements online and visit, on average, nine sites before making a choice. And after the trip, more than half of internet users share their views on the web. This revolution has weighed heavily on the tour operator's market. Before the internet, we used travel agencies to book our holidays for us. 
but that's all changing. The tour operators were forced to rethink their business model. Either I resist change or offer something different. It comes at a heavy cost. French tour operators had losses totaling 130 million in the years 2011, 12 and 13. Some have almost disappeared and a few have disappeared. So they revised their models, offering extra services and security, security is very important, or exclusive destinations. Philippe, the big question then, does digital create or destroy jobs? They are creating new services and creating new markets. Um, and so that's why I think it creates more jobs than I would say, you know, I, I don't see why it would destroy jobs. I think this is an enormous, uh, you know, value creation uh, opportunity by giving more choice to, uh, to, to the consumer. But Fred, when you talk to CEOs of incumbent industries, do you find that they're ready to take on the digital challenge? It's just like if uh, 100 years ago when things uh, were getting industrialized, we were asking ourselves if we had to do it or not. I guess it was the same kind of questions. Now we're in the technology cycle and we have to adapt to it so we will do it everybody will, will go that way and now with all this technology uh, environment it's going faster than usual but I think it's just a normal evolution. How does Europe attract and create the second Silicon Valley that Fred was talking about? In Europe is you have you know 12 14 cities you know that can be distance of you know several hundred miles or you know a thousand miles with Moscow but actually they're all burgeoning ecosystem. And we have seen this ecosystem maturing, you know, for the past uh, 14 years, right, since the first bubble. Now you have, you know, companies like Supercell, for example, which was, you know, three billion or outcome. You know, you have Zoopla. If anything, gives us, you know, more willingness to invest in Europe. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>